This is the second part of Unit 1, Modes of Realism. In it, I'll go over the following stories. Sarah Orne Jewett's A White Heron, Mary Wilkins Freeman's A New England Nun, and Kate Chopin's The Storm. These three writers have been discussed under the umbrella term regionalism. They have also been called local color writers because of their emphasis on detailed descriptions of regions that lie beyond the urban and cultural centers of the United States. Regionalists are often misrepresented as writers concerned only with writing, entertaining local color stories featuring quaint characters whose customs and habits are a throwback in time. But these writers reflect historical changes and concerns as well. Huge changes in the demographics and social makeup of America begins to complicate and enrich the notion of what an American is at this time. After the Civil War, whole new areas of the United States become connected by railway and telegraph. And those regions begin to insist on being heard from. In response, writers begin to write a particular kind of realism that highlights specific characteristics associated with these particular regions. Literature responds to these demographic changes by helping readers to identify with people they may not encounter on a day-to-day -day basis, in places they may never go. But as Americans, they understand that they should have an interest in knowing about them. If you think about it, the focus on regions and regional differences is part of the democratic process. We see that literature of the time begins to reflect the question on many Americans' minds. Who are we as a country and where are we going? In these stories, we see literary elements associated with realism, and they are realism, just a particular kind. Let me review them. Those characters, um, in, the characters in these stories resemble ordinary people in ordinary circumstances. They speak like real people. Regionalist writers often make use of orthographic changes to convey particular speech rhythms and other elements of dialect peculiar to regional life. The stories are set in places that actually exist or might easily have actual prototypes. And because of the focus on region, setting can become a conspicuous element as it does in A White Heron. So you've heard that in the first part of the, uni the unit and I'm repeating it again, so you might make note of it. Uh, it might be important on your exam. To sum up, regionalism is interested in depicting objective and subjective reality but is more focused on the margins of American life. Regional realism expands the definition of American and begins to highlight the concerns of those from the other side of the track, so to speak. The underclasses and those who have previously been underrepresented or not represented at all. The stories you read for today do just that. At the same time, these stories bring up issues that challenge the status quo. In particular, the stories by Jewett, Freeman, and Chopin ask us to think about gender roles. Sarah Orne Jewett's A White Heron is a quintessential example of turn-of-the-century regionalism. We have all the ha hallmarks of regionalism, a rural setting, characters who speak in dialect, and an emphasis on local customs. Jewett takes us to the backwoods of Maine. This is a primitive place, as suggested by the description on page 528, um, in the second to the last paragraph on that page. Here we have the perspective of the young male outsider who is capturing birds. He, quote, had known the horrors of this region's most primitive housekeeping and the dreary squalor of that level of society which does not rebel at the companionship of hens. Sylvia's home is not like that, um, however, but Jewett is calling attention to the backwoods nature of this region. But the story isn't just a mirror of reality. Remember that we've noted that realism isn't necessarily an unmediated reality, and this story demands to be read allegorically. For example, by giving her protagonist the name Sylvia from the Latin word for woods, forest, and wilderness, Jewett suggests that her story is more than just a charming portrait of New England, rural New England. Sylvia is not merely experiencing the wilderness, but is in some sense the wilderness itself. Her grandmother says, there never was such a child for straying about of doors since the world was made. There's an allegorical role for the hunter as well. 
He isn't just an outsider to this region. He represents this threat of society, um, the threat of society to the wilderness. Sylvia's initial response to his whistle is horror. We're told that the hunter reminds her of a bull, boy who used to bully her, and at first she is sure her grandmother's making a big mistake by inviting the stranger in. This is also an adventure story. Um, an adventure story in miniature, of course. Sylvia devises a plan to find the heron. Her sneaking out early in the morning to climb the tree is parallel to Huck's voyage down the river on his raft. We could even say, and it has been likened to by scholars, it's, it's like Ishmael's sea voyage and whale hunt in Moby Dick. Sylvia can't sleep the night before. She keeps her quest a secret. It is grueling and challenging. And that tree that she climbs, it demands our attention in the story because of how remarkable it is. The tree stands high above the leaf canopy, at least twice as tall as all the other trees. It is probably a boundary marker or a guide tree for boats coming into the harbor um, or bay, which is miles away. But it also seems like the center of the world. In the second full paragraph on page 533, this is how that tree is described. The tree seemed to lengthen itself out as she went up and to reach farther and farther upward. It was like a great, great mainmast to the voyaging earth. It must truly have been amazed that morning through all it, through all its frame, as it felt this determined spark of human spirit winding its way from higher branch to branch. The old pine must have loved his new dependent. This is a pretty remarkable passage. Sylvia is the captain and the tree is her ship. She is in charge. And if that wasn't amazing enough, the narrator also gets into the consciousness or being of the tree to suggest that it loves Sylvia. Sylvia loves nature and nature loves her right back. As the captain and as one who is beloved, she has great responsibility which culminates in her decision not to tell the hunter about her discovery. This is how Jewett describes Sylvia's response to the hunter's request that she reveal the heron's nest. This passage starts on the bottom of page 532. Sylvia does not speak after all. Though the old grandmother fretfully rebukes her and the young man's kind appealing eyes are looking straight in her own, he can make them rich with money he has promised it, and they are poor now. He is so well worth making happy. No, she must keep silent. What is it that suddenly forbids her and makes her dumb? Has she been nine years growing, and now, when the great world for the first time puts out a hand to her, must she thrust it aside for a bird's sake? The murmur of the pine's green branches is in her ears. She remembers how the white heron came flying through the golden air and how they watch the sea and the morning together. And Sylvia cannot speak. She cannot tell the heron's secret and give its life away. There are multiple ways to read Sylvia's choice. She chooses nature over society, sustainability and conservation over economic gain, life over death. In the context of regionalism, we might also see that she sides with wilderness over the city, represented by the hunter. She does not succumb to the outsider's wishes, which might bring change to the region. Lastly, considering the crush she has developed on the hunter, we might also see Sylvia's choice as a refusal to be subordinate to male desire. In the last paragraph of the story, the narrator tells us that, loyalty had suffered a sharp pang as the guest went away that could have served and followed him and loved him as a dog loves. If this is what Sylvia has avoided, serving and loving him as a dog, then she is better off, I think. She chooses to honor the heron and her own independence and freedom. We might say the same about Louisa in Mary Wilkins Freeman's story, A New England Nun. She too chooses to remain single while also refusing to change the habits she has developed over the course of 14 years. Again, this is a regional story about a stereotype of sorts, a New England spinster, um, but it touches upon larger social issues. Of course, this story takes a slightly different tone. 
where Sylvia is depicted with sympathetic and complimenting tones, Freeman has a little fun at Luisa's expense. Let's consider Le Luisa a little bit more. For goodness sake, she wears three aprons. That's a pretty funny thing. She wants to keep um, her fancy apron below her work aprons. She keeps a very tidy house. Um, and I'm wondering if any of you thought OCD when you were reading descriptions about her. She's also a bit of a scandal in her town, but for kind of minimal reasons. Whereas everyone else in town uses plain crock crockery, Louisa uses fancy china. And rather than spend her time doing chores associated with the practical concerns of running a household, Louisa spends her days distilling essences and perfumes from flowers. She has her own still, and she rips out seams for the pleasure of resewing them. In other words, she does things for pleasure and not out of necessity or practicality. How shocking. We could poke a little fun at her, but Louisa is a woman who is admirable for her inclination to do things for her own pleasure. A description on page 654 reads, Louisa was slow and still in her movements. It took her a long time to prepare her tea, but when ready, it was set forth with as much grace as if she had been a veritable guest to her own self. In other words, Louisa lives for herself, with no harm to others, despite what others think. This could be seen as progressive. Like a white heron, Freeman doesn't just present elements observed from objective reality. She weaves in symbolism to suggest larger themes related to Louisa's psychology. For example, there's that canary on page 655 that wakes up and flutters every time Joe enters the room. While Louisa never overtly wavers in her commitment to marry Joe, the canary suggests that she is upset by their pending wedding. And then there's the dog, Caesar. Did you notice that he has been chained up for 14 years, the same number of years Louisa has been engaged to and geographically distant from Joe? In addition, the same adjective used to describe Louisa is used to describe Caesar. She is her own veritable guest, and he is a veritable hermit. We might ask about the parallel between Louisa and Caesar. What is Louisa keeping chained up and under wraps? Joe threatens to let the dog loose after they are married. Will she too be let loose? And if she marries Joe, will Louisa go on a rampage through the quiet and unguarded village? Will innocence bleed in her path? It is hard to imagine, but funny, to envision her biting people who get in her way. But we should ask what Louisa is afraid of. She lives in a very controlled and orderly world. Who, why is she afraid of losing control? When we ask these kinds of qu questions, the story moves from being an entertaining story with a nice tidy ending. We begin to pick up on details that call into question Louisa's feelings for Joe Daggett. There's some doubt, for example, about whether Louisa ever really loved Joe. 15 years ago, the narrator tells us, she had been in love with him, at least she considered herself to be. Just at that time, gently acquiescing with and falling into the natural drift of girlhood, she had seen marriage ahead as a reasonable feature and a probable desirability of life. She had listened with calm docility to her mother's views upon the subject. She talked wisely to her daughter when Joe Daggett presented himself and Louisa accepted him with no hesitation. There's not much passion in that description Marriage is reasonable and a probable desirability. And it seems her mother played a huge part in her decision. She talked Louisa into engaging herself to Joe. Adding to this is the fact that Louisa doesn't seem a bit sad when Joe leaves her for Australia. She doesn't put up any fuss, and in 14 years, she doesn't seem to have been bothered by his abs absence. Like Sylvia, Louisa's decision to break off the engagement could be seen as a statement about female independence. Freeman likens Louisa to an artist. On page 658, she writes, Louisa had almost the enthusiasm of an artist over the mere order and cleanliness of her solitary home. 
Like female artists at the, this time, Louisa lives outside the conventions of society. The convention here is that women should marry. Louisa is in charge of her world, which Joe poses a threat to. But there's loss in this story as well. We heard it in the negative tone at the end of A White Heron as well. Although Sylvia protects the heron and her own independence, there is a sense of the loss in the hunter's departure. In A New England Nun, Louisa's choice also presents a negative situation. We see this in the last paragraph on page 663, and I'm going to read um, parts of that. If Louisa Ellis had sold her birthright, she did not know it. The taste of the pottage was so delicious and had been her sole satisfaction for so long. Serenity and placid narrowness had become to her as the birthright itself. She gazed ahead through a long reach of future days, strung together like pearls in a rosary, every one like the others, and all smooth and flawless and innocent, and her heart went up in thankfulness. Louisa sat prayerfully numbering her days like an uncloistered nun. She has freedom and independence um, when she contrives for Joe to marry the woman he really loves, but there's also a sense of sterility and inflexibility. You hear that especially in the description, placid narrowness. There's a vacillation in tone. On the one hand, she's admirable for choosing to live as she wants and not bowing to social pressure. At the same time, she's isolated and the parameters of her life are minimal. There's a cost for going against society. The last story uh, for this part of the unit is Kate Chopin's The Storm. And this presents an entirely different sort of female character. This story features another region of the United States. We move from New England to Louisiana. But it also raises similar issues about gender, marriage, female desire, and the constraints of social propriety. The storm reveals the hallmarks of regionalism. Her characters speak the patois of Creole and Cajun communities, and she spends time delineating details about Louisiana houses and landscapes. This is a way of life that is very different from the main centers of American life. Um, as an aside, there's a nice use of literary technique as well. Notice how she builds tension in the description of the coming storm in the story's first paragraph. We know something is going to happen. The storm is um, arising passions in the characters. The story also offers a remarkable example of female desire and independence. Calixta is a married woman who finds momentary freedom during a sexual encounter with Alce, who is a former suitor of hers. Um, and you can read about that, their, their former courtship in At the Cadian Ball. Um, Chopin never published this story during her lifetime. You can imagine the shock it might have caused, but rather than invite us to condemn Calixta or Alce, Chopin uses the, these characters to comment on the larger social structures they live in. To understand Chopin's message, we have to look at the progression of the story. After the steaming love scene between Calixta and Alce, who has taken shelter from the storm in Calixta's house, Chopin offers us three short scenes. The first of these, which is titled Part Three, features Bobino and Bibi, Calixta's husband and son, um, who return to Calixta, um, who shows no sign of guilt that she's just had an affair uh, in their absence. Instead, she offers an outpouring of affection and solicitude that surprises her husband. And rather than feeling suspicious, Bobino, we are told, relaxes and enjoys himself. The scene ends with the following description of a very happy family. When the three seated themselves at table, they laughed much and so loud that anyone might have heard them as far away as the Balliers. Part four is another very short section, and it features Alce, Calixta's lover, writing a loving letter full of tender solicitude, that's the description, to his wife. It ends with him ceding to his wife's desire to stay on vacation, away from her husband, for a month longer. There's the implication that he hadn't been willing to give in to his wife's wishes before the brief encounter with Calixta. Having had sex outside his marriage, however, encourages him to be more sympathetic to his wife's wishes. 
And finally, we have part five, the briefest of these scenes. It turns to Alsace's wife, Clarisse, who expresses relief at being allowed a brief respite from her marriage. Chopin writes, and the first free breath since her marriage seemed to restore the pleasant liberty of her maiden days. Devoted as she was to her husband, their intimate conjugal life was something which she was more than willing to forego for a while. The use of maiden days suggests that Clarice is glad to have a break from having sex with her husband. Quite remarkably, rather than turn this into a sordid story about betrayal, Chopin imagines all the characters as benefiting from this brief sexual affair. As she writes, so the storm passed and everyone was happy. I think we can understand why Chopin did not publish this story in her lifetime.